Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on experimental techniques. Uh, in this video, what we're going to talk about is the technique of immunofluorescence. Okay, uh, so the structure for this video is we're going to start off uh, with a bit of motivation for immunofluorescence. Okay, so we're going to say what are we actually trying to achieve and uh, then what we'll go over to is discussing a bit of the physics. We'll discuss fluorescence, what fluorescence is. We'll see some examples of fluorochromes. And then finally, we'll move on to talk about the two different types of immunofluorescence, direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence. Okay, so let's start off with the motivation for immunofluorescence. So this is what we're trying to achieve. Basically, let's say we have some protein but we don't know where it actually is within the cell. So we've just found this protein, we don't know what it does, and uh, the starting point for trying to figure out what it does is to find out where it is localized within a cell, because that will give you clues as to its function. Okay, so for instance, if I draw a picture of a cell, like so, maybe it's in the plasma membrane. The protein could be an integral membrane protein that's within the plasma membrane. We also have a lipid bilayer around the nucleus. It could be in the nuclear membrane. Uh, we also have loads of other uh, membrane-bound organelles, such as the ER. It could be within the lumen of the ER or uh, within the membrane of the ER. So basically, there are loads of possible locations uh, for our protein, and we want to try and find where it is. So that, let's just draw a little protein here that's in the membrane of the ER. Okay, right. Uh, so immunofluorescence is a technique that will allow us to find out uh, the location of our protein, basically. It's going to allow us to locate proteins within a cell. Okay, right. So that's the motivation for what we're trying to achieve. Now we're going to go over to a bit of physics. What does it mean to fluoresce? What is fluorescence? Okay, and the first challenge is spelling the word. Right, so there we go, fluorescence. Right, so, basically, fluorescence. Fluorescence involves molecules known as fluorochromes, okay? So let's say this box just represents some molecule, and this molecule is a fluorochrome. Now, fluorochromes are just molecules which fluoresce, okay? But what is fluorescence? Well, basically, it means that they will interact with light, basically. They will absorb uh, photons, okay? And it doesn't necessarily have to be visible light. Often it's ultraviolet light, for instance. When we talk about fluorescence, we usually talk about uh, absorption of UV light and then the emission of visible light. And that really is the core of what fluorescence is. It means that you um, will absorb photons, okay, of a certain frequency. And the symbol for frequency is the symbol nu here. Okay, so let me just remind you of what uh, frequency means, basically. Frequency means how many waves will occur a second, basically. So, if I just draw the wave for you. Okay, so the wave will propagate through space, basically. It's an electromagnetic wave, a photon. Right, and basically, the wavelength is how much distance it takes to cover a certain, um, well, how much distance it takes to complete a full wave, basically. Okay, so this is the wavelength here, and its speed will be the speed of light, because all the electromagnetic photons travel at the speed of light, okay, which is around 3 times 10 to the power of 8. So, basically, it is going to move 3 times 10 to the power of 8 Oh, I should have given this unit, sorry about that, meters per second. So in a second, it's going to move 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. Okay, so if it goes lambda meters in one wave, how many waves is it going to complete within a second? That's the frequency question. How many waves are going to occur within a second? Well, if it's going to move 3 times 10 to the 8 meters, okay, in a second, so that's something like this if you like, all we need to know is how many of these waves fit into 3 times 10 to the 8, and that will then give us how many waves will occur a second. Okay, so the frequency then 
is the speed of light, which is this distance that you'll cover in a second, divided by uh, the distance of one wave, which will tell us how many waves fit into uh, this entire 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. I'm sorry, I've not made them all equal distance. I should have been more careful doing that. Okay. Um, Right, so that's what that is saying. So that's basically what frequency is. It's inversely proportional to uh, wavelength down here. So lambda is the symbol for wavelength, uh, which is how long, how much distance it takes to cover a single wave. Right, so you will absorb a certain uh, frequency of um, radiation, basically, a certain frequency of photon. Okay, and we'll call this the frequency of excitation. So you will absorb this photon, that will give you some energy, and you will then use that energy to emit another photon. And you might think that it's all rather futile, uh, but what will change is that this photon will have a different frequency, basically. It'll be a different color uh, if, it, if we're talking about the visible spectrum. Of course, if it's not visible, then it won't be a different color, but it will still be a different frequency. Right. Okay, now, basically, the frequency of the emitted photon is always lower than the frequency of the uh, absorbed photon, basically. And the reason for this is that energy, the energy of a photon, is equal to the Planck constant times by the frequency. So, basically, if you give me the frequency, I can multiply it by some constant, which I think is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34, and I will get out the energy of that photon, basically. Okay, so, we are absorbing this photon. We will get all the energy associated with that photon. We'll get Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon in energy. Okay, and we've then got, uh, we're then about to emit a photon. Okay, now we can't just magic up energy from nowhere. So, the energy that we use has to have come from the energy that we got from this photon. Okay, uh, so it can only be less than or equal to, and it's nearly always less than, and I'll explain that for in a moment. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, basically, this is the property of fluorescence. A fluorochrome is a molecule which will absorb photons of a certain frequency and give out photons of a different frequency, and that different frequency will be uh, lower than the original frequency, basically. Now, what does this mean in terms of wavelength? Well, basically, if we think about what wavelength is, wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency, just rearranging this equation. Okay, so as the frequency gets smaller, we're dividing by a smaller number, so that means that the wavelength is going to get bigger. So basically, the wavelength of the emitted light will be greater than the wavelength of the, um, of the absorbed light. Okay, so this will be bigger than the wavelength of the excitation. Right, okay, so now before we talk about uh, fluorescence in a bit more detail, let's actually see some examples of uh, fluorochromes. Okay, and we're going to see some examples of extremely important fluorochromes in immunofluorescence. Okay, so the first one we're going to see is something that's called FIT-C for short, okay, and this stands for fluorazine isothiocyanate. So the F is for fluorozine, okay, and then the ITC is for isothiocyanate. Okay, right, so let me start by showing you the structure of fluorozine, okay, so let me highlight this in. So we'll start with by showing the structure of fluorozine, and then we'll move on to the structure of isothiocyanate. Right, so fluorozine has within it four aromatic rings. Okay, so let me start by drawing these aromatic rings, and three of them are all connected to each other, so let's draw the three that are connected to each other first. Okay, so here we go. Oh, whoops, I've missed something off. There needs to be an oxygen there. I do apologise, most of these are carbon, but there is an oxygen there. Okay, so, uh, we're drawing a skeletal structure, so we're, we don't show carbons, they are implicitly shown by corners and by um, places like that. Okay, and we don't show hydrogens coming off carbon atoms either. Where there are missing bonds of carbon atoms, it's implicitly assumed that you realise that that is because those other bonds are to hydrogen atoms. 
Okay, right. Now there are some double bonds in this structure. So there is a double bond here, a double bond here, a double bond here, a double bond here, and a double bond here and here. Okay, and off this carbon at the top here, you then have a carbonyl group coming off there, and off this carbon opposite it, all the way over here, you have an alcohol group. Okay, now that's not fluorazine complete yet. To complete it, you then have to have a benzene ring coming off down here. Okay, so this is the fourth aromatic ring down here. And then also off this uh, benzene ring, you will then have a carboxylic acid group. Okay, so here it is. And I know I've broken the skeletal formula uh, rule here by showing the carbon, uh, but car carboxylic acid groups look scarier if you draw their skeletal formula than they do if you draw their molecular formula, whereas this structure would look far scarier if I'd drawn it in its molecular formula rather than its skeletal formula. So basically I'm just trying to make a structure that looks as simple as possible rather than rigorously sticking to rules. Okay, right, uh, so this is the structure of fluorazine, okay? Now, we're going to bind this to an isothiocyanate group. So let me explain what an isothiocyanate group is. So, this is the structure of an isothiocyanate group. It's not a molecule, it's a group. It's something you stick on the side of molecules. Okay, so you have a nitrogen atom bound to a carbon atom by a double bond, and then bound to a sulfur atom by a double bond. So this is isothiocyanate here. Okay, and what's going to happen is we are going to stick this isothiocyanate group onto our fluorazine molecule to get fluorazine isothiocyanate, which is FITSI, okay, which is a good fluorochrome molecule. And we're going to stick the isothiocyanate molecule on this bottom carbon here. Okay, so here is the uh, isothiocyanate molecule stuck onto our fluorazine isothiocyanate. Okay, right. Now let's see the structure of another uh, important fluorochrome in biology, which this time is called TRITSI, okay? And uh, TRITSI stands for tetramethylrhodamine isothiocyanate, uh, but we'll see the structure of TRITSI in the next video.